How many of you wear glasses, or I can see that, but how many of you wear contacts? Contacts. So, so just, if you are visually impaired to some degree, raise your hand. All right, that is most of us. A few of you, you are not, but most of us are. And I remember the, the first time that I got a pair of glasses. I think I was in fourth grade, somewhere abouts there. And, and I remember driving home after getting my glasses and thinking, wow you can see the individual leaves on a tree. <laughs> I didn't know you could do that. I just thought it was sort of a green area there on top of the tree. All right, and so I mean, maybe you have a memory like that, but obviously my vision needed correcting, but it slowly over time had deteriorated, so I didn't notice that I wasn't seeing the things that I should be seeing. I lost my vision slowly. And see, our glasses, our contact lenses, they give us the perspective that we need on the world. They, they help us to see things as we should see them. And as we're talking about our dress code, these things that Paul shares with us that we are to clothe ourselves with, what we're going to talk about this morning, I think, in many ways, is going to have an effect on our vision. Because one of the things that I've noticed is that God wants us to see this world and to see people and to see our lives, not, not through our natural perspective, not just through a human perspective, but through His eyes and through His perspective. And that happens when we come to know Christ, but something that I've observed in my own life and in others is that we tend sometimes to start out seeing things God's way and seeing people God's way, but sometimes our vision starts to slowly deteriorate. And we begin to start looking at things more from our perspective than God's perspective. Have you ever noticed that? And God wants us to correct that vision. So how do we correct our vision? Well, if you have glasses or contacts, you sort of know how the process goes, right? The better one or two. Anybody ever get confused with that? All right. I was like, how about a three? You know, just mix it up. Um, but that's how we get our vision corrected. Uh, the eye doctor he gives us some options. We, we look at, at what works. And this morning, we're going to see what helps correct our vision. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Just to refresh our minds this morning. Paul says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And so this morning, we're going to talk about meekness. There we go. Forgot my glasses slide. What do you think about when you hear the word meekness? What, what pops into your mind? It's not a word that we probably use in everyday conversation, but anybody have an idea of what meekness is or what you think about when you hear the word meekness? Just, I'm not looking necessarily for the correct definition, but when I say meekness, what do you think? Somebody. Gentle. Gentle. All right. Anybody else? Humble. Humble. Quiet spirit. Quiet spirit. Anybody else? Anybody think weakness? Did anybody? Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. A lot of times, and, and those answers were, were all very much part of what meekness is, but a lot of times when we think about meekness, we think about weakness. And I think partly because it rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> it rhymes with weak. Meekness is actually one of the more difficult words in the New Testament to translate. This word does not translate easily and so that also helps us sometimes have a little bit of a struggle when thinking about what meekness is. Meekness has the idea of power under control. Power under control. And that might be described as self-control. And self-control is part of meekness, but meekness goes further than that. Meekness is choosing to submit to the will and the desire of someone else. Meekness is choosing to submit to the will and the desire of someone else. So the meek person is not self-willed, not concerned with self, not concerned with his own ways, ideas, or wishes. So it's sort of the opposite of being self-willed. It's the opposite of being self-seeking or uh, self-assertive. And I want you to see this morning that, that clothing ourselves with meekness is something that all of us need to do. All right? Because our Father in Heaven knows the best way for us to dress. And although meekness was not popular when Paul wrote this letter, in Greek thought and philosophy, meekness was not a desired virtue. 
And in our culture today, just like humility and meekness very much ties in with humility, meekness is not something that our culture holds up. But as a follower of Christ, as someone who's been called to live in God's kingdom, as a citizen of God's kingdom, God calls us to dress differently. Not according to culture, but according to his word. One of my favorite verses that I fell in love with here, it was Gladys Chahi's favorite verse. And it's Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Think about that. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. That's not a, a small thing to say because crucifixion was the most painful and torturous form of execution. And Paul says, I, I have identified with Jesus' death. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. You see, that's the essence of the Christian life. It's not about you anymore. It's not about me anymore. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I have new life that I got from the new birth. And he says, the life I now live in the flesh, I'm still here. But he says, now I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And we've been talking about that motivation, about why should we choose to clothe ourselves with these things. And the motivation is God's incredible love for us. His affection and his kindness and his grace. He says, I, I give up my life for Christ because he loved me and he gave up himself for me. You see, when God calls you to give up your life for him and to follow him and to trust him, he's not doing anything that Jesus did not do for you. And so meekness, then, is a surrendering of our lives to the purpose, the power, and the person of Jesus. So remember I said meekness is submitting yourself, putting yourself under someone else. Meekness begins by being meek towards God. And so meekness is surrendering our lives to the purpose and the power and the person of Jesus. Think about that. Meekness is a gift that God gives. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit Paul talks about in Galatians. And so this is something that God gives us the ability to do. Isn't that great? God never asks us to do something that he does not enable us to do. You know, how many of you feel like you've been asked to do things in life that were impossible? Anybody? All right. Anybody feel like that happened this week? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> You're being watched. Sometimes we're put in situations where we feel like someone asked us to do something. We think, there's no way I can do that. That's impossible. But God never asks us to do something that he will not enable us to do. He will ask you to do things that you can't do on your own all the time. But he will never ask you to do something that he will not enable you to do. And meekness is a gift that God gives. It's a work of his spirit in us. And so then God wants us to take this work of his spirit in us and allow it to show out on the outside. It doesn't mean that we're weak. It doesn't mean that we're not bold. It just means that we become bold in the way that Jesus was bold. And so, just as we have each day, I want us to, to take some time to think about how Jesus not only taught this, but how he demonstrated meekness for us. And I want to start in Matthew, and then we're going to jump over to 1 Peter for a little bit. But if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Because as Jesus is teaching, he starts to talk about this concept of meekness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Matthew, or Jesus says this. He says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. How do you think it would have felt to hear Jesus say that one day on the side of the Sea of Galilee as he shares this message on a hillside? Because that's a really radical thought, isn't it? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the meek inherit the earth? I mean, the meek might inherit the earth, but they're the last ones in the line in the cafeteria, right? You see, our world says that if you want to get ahead, if you want to be successful, then you have to what? You have to get it for yourself. You have to climb the ladder yourself. You have to do whatever it takes to advance yourself. And Jesus says there's a different way to live. Contrary to the wisdom of the world, you don't have to strive to get what you want. And if you have to step on some people, if you have to push some people out of the way to get what you want, so be it. 
because it's all about getting what you want. And Jesus says, no, the meek will inherit the earth. We should understand that those who don't know Christ and who aren't part of His kingdom won't get this concept. But we who are should. And yet sadly, many times as followers of Christ, we do not live out these characteristics in our life. Just look at a lot of our churches where people are striving and straining to get their way, where they want their preferences and their desires, and it's all about them. In the very place where meekness should be most displayed, many times it's not. We get mad, we get hurt, we get offended. How could they do that to me? We seek our agenda over the agenda of Jesus when we start looking at the world through our eyes instead of His. Jesus said, The meek will inherit the earth. It's an upside down way to live. But it's the way of Jesus and it's the way that you're called to live. And here's something you need to understand. Meekness puts you in a position where you have to trust your Father in heaven. You see, being meek means I have to trust that God is big enough to take care of my life. That God is big enough to fulfill the purposes that He has for me. And that I don't have to strive and strain and push people down in order to accomplish what God's called me to do. Meekness is trusting your Heavenly Father with the circumstances that He allows in your life. You know, all of us go through things in life that don't always make sense. And people will treat you wrong. And people will hurt you. People already have. And they will do it again. Things will happen that, that will not make sense to you. And our natural instinct is to lash out. I mean, when, how many of you have ever felt like your rights have been violated? Anybody? All right, what, what do you, when your rights are violated, what do you want to do? Somebody tell me. Luke. I can tell you want to answer. <laughs> uh, you get angry usually. And you get angry? Yeah, you want to confront them, you want to stand up for it, you want to defend it, right? That's our natural instinct is to fight for our rights. And when we're hurt, we lash out. And Jesus showed us a different way. He wants us to see life and the circumstances and the things that happen to us, not through just our natural eyes, but through spiritual eyes. He wants us to correct our vision. And we do that through meekness. Jesus showed us a different way. And just as we've seen all week, Jesus did not just teach these things. He lived these things. I want you to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're just going to look at a couple of verses there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. Peter, writing about Jesus, said, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. So he's describing Jesus' sinlessness, his perfection. He said there was no deceit in his mouth. Then in verse 23, it says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself. To him who judges justly. I want us to, to just really soak in these words for a moment and think about what Peter's saying about Jesus. It says, when they hurled their insults at him, another different translation, when they hurled their insults at him, and he's, he's talking about what happened to Jesus, right? The night of his crucifixion and the day of his crucifixion. He says, when they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. Can you just imagine that for a moment? Here is Jesus. He is the creator and the sustainer of the earth. The very people that are hurling insults at him, it's by his power that they are even able to take a breath. And as they hurl insults at Jesus, it says he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Jesus has shown us how to clothe our lives with meekness. And just as with humility, he trusted his Father. Look at what it says. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Even though he was insulted. It doesn't feel good to be insulted, does it? It hurts. It stinks. And Jesus knows what it feels like. 
He was there. And even though he was insulted, and even though he was threatened, he did not retaliate. He made no threats because he trusted his Father. Because Jesus got handed over a whole bunch of times that night, didn't he? Right? Judas betrays him in the garden, and he gets handed over to the soldiers. Then the soldiers, they hand him over to Pilate. Pilate hands him over to Herod. Herod hands him back over to Pilate. Pilate hands him over to the Jews, and the Jews hand him back over to Pilate to crucify him. But all the while, Jesus handed himself over to the Father. It's what he prayed in the garden, right? Not my will, but yours. And Jesus showed us what it looks like to clothe our lives with meekness. Look back in verse 21. Peter's addressing people that are going through suffering. In fact, if we would look back, we'd see that in verse 20. But in verse 21, he says this, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. He left you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Jesus left us an example so that we could follow in his steps. He didn't just tell us how to live. He showed us how to live. And how he handled himself in the events surrounding his crucifixion, he displayed the most powerful example of meekness that has ever been demonstrated in humanity. Because he had every right to retaliate. He had the power to retaliate, and he could have done it justly. He had every right to threaten. But he did not. Meekness does not mean that we're weak. Right? It, it does not mean that we are weak. Jesus was anything but weak as he endured the trials and the beating and the mocking and the crucifixion that he endured on your behalf and my behalf. He was anything but weak. Meekness doesn't mean that we don't live boldly. God wants you to live boldly. He wants you to be very bold for him. He just doesn't want our boldness to be a self-willed, self-centered boldness that's all about us. Meekness means that we don't live for ourselves. It goes back to what Paul shared in Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. It's not about me anymore. It's not me who lives anymore. It's Christ who lives in me. It's not my life anymore. And so I don't live for myself. Instead, I live boldly for Christ and for His kingdom in the way of Jesus. God wants you to clothe your life with meekness. He wants me to clothe my life with meekness. In order to do that, we have to hand our lives over to the Father. Because there are going to be situations that occur in your lives that will make you want to lash out and make you want to retaliate. And we're going to talk about patience tomorrow. have been waiting all week, I know. He started it. <laughs> But we have to trust Jesus with our lives. All the way to the cross, Jesus was meek. Even on the cross, he demonstrated meekness. There were seven sayings that he made, and one of them is recorded in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And he says this, he says, Father, what? Forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. Here they were, the very people that had not only nailed him to the cross. I mean, they didn't just do their duty. They mocked him and they made fun of him. They taunted him. If you're the Son of God, if you're really who you claim to be, why don't you come down from that cross? Have you ever been mocked and made fun of? It makes you want to what? It makes you want to prove them wrong. But Jesus didn't respond to them. Instead, he trusted his life to the Father. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Your Father in heaven wants you to clothe your life with meekness. And remember this, He loves you. And He has a perfect plan for your life. Right? And even if that plan includes hardship, even if that plan includes suffering, His plan is good. No one suffered more than Jesus. But it was through His suffering that the greatest good that's ever been accomplished was made. All right, most of you got to see my son, right? And I love all of you. I know most of you. You're, 
and I care about you, and I would do anything for you, and I would give up my life for you, but I don't know if I could make the decision to give up my son for you. I mean, you're great, but you're not as great as he is. But that's exactly the choice that your Father in Heaven made for you. Even this, in the garden, Jesus pleaded with his Father, remember? He said, Father, if there's any way that this cup can pass, if there's any other way that your plan can be accomplished, and I don't have to go through this, please don't let me go through this. Can you imagine what it would be like for a father to hear a son say that? I mean, if my kids are hurting and there's a way that I can alleviate their hurt, I'm going to do that. And the father said no. Why? Because he loves you and I. God's not willing that any should perish. And so he gave up his son on your behalf. And that's the motivation. That's the reason. That's why we are called to live in the way of Jesus. Because of his incredible and radical love for us. He wants meekness to be on display in our lives. A power that gives us the ability to handle the insults of life. With grace and strength. Not reacting you know, sometimes we go around in life just constantly reacting to things, don't we? Reacting to this, reacting to that. One of the fascinating things that I see in the life of Jesus is that he was never, ever in a situation where he was reacting to people. Do you notice that? He never reacted. But rather, he powerfully and forcefully advanced the purposes of his Father. And that's what meekness enables us to do. God wants you to advance the agenda of his kingdom. Boldly. Confidently, powerfully. Meekness allows us to do that because we live not for ourselves and not for our agenda, but for the agenda and the purposes of Jesus. Meekness is surrendering our lives to the purpose and the power of Christ. Meekness is an invitation to trust your Father and to re represent Him to the world. What would happen in your life if you truly clothed yourself with meekness? What would happen in your church if your church family clothed their lives with meekness? And here's the thing. It's good for us. It's good for us. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 19 says, The meek... Oops. We'll just close that. thought I had one more slide. You'll just have to listen. Isaiah 29... In fact, why don't you turn there? Isaiah 29 19. It says, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord. Isn't that a great thought? It says, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. You see, God's kingdom is so upside down from the world's ideas. The world's ideas are that the meek will finish last, and the poor don't matter. Isn't that how the world looks at things? And God says, no, the meek will obtain fresh joy and the poor will exalt in the Holy One of Israel. Meekness is surrendering your life to the purpose, to the power, and to the person of Jesus. You first have to be meek towards God. Remember, meekness is submitting your life to the will and desires of someone else. And so the invitation to clothe yourself with meekness is an invitation to say, I want to surrender my life to the person and the power and the purpose of Christ. That's where meekness begins. That's what will enable you to then not react to all the things that happen to you, but be able to see it through God's eyes. Remember we talked about our vision, right? When we have meekness, we'll be able to see people differently. It's what enabled Jesus to look at the very people that were crucifying and realize they needed forgiveness and grace. They didn't understand what they were doing. And God wants us to have the same attitude towards those who would treat us that way. And I want you to know, that's, not, that's supernatural, right? That's not a natural way to live. But God gives us the power to live supernaturally. So I just want you to bow your heads for a moment this morning. I just want us to take, as we sort of do each morning, a couple moments to just reflect and, and to think about how God might want us to apply this to our lives. And so I just, 
I just want to ask you, maybe, maybe you're, you're, you're carrying some hurt this morning because of something that somebody's done to you. Maybe somebody has hurt you. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend. I don't know who it might be, but maybe somebody has really hurt you. and You've been carrying around the pain of that hurt. And today I want you to know that, that, that Jesus knows that pain. He understands that pain. And He wants you to trust Him with it. To give it to Him. To let Him heal that hurt. And to give you the power not to retaliate, not to seek revenge, not to get even. But to trust your heart to the Father. And to know that even through this He can accomplish His purpose and His will. And for all of us, I want us to just picture the meekness of Jesus. Power, absolute power, under control. Under the Spirit's control. That's how He wants you and I to live. It's not about being weak. It's just about being bold for Jesus and for His kingdom and His glory and His agenda and not our own agenda. And maybe you'd be honest and say, you know, my life is sort of more about my own agenda than Jesus' agenda. Maybe you need to repent of that and ask God to redirect the course of your life. Just take a few moments and, and be quiet before your Father in Heaven and let Him speak to your heart this morning. Father, I thank you so much that you have called us and invited us to live in your kingdom. Father, I pray that we would never ever get over the incredible mercy and grace that you have shown us through Christ and this incredible invitation that you've called us to, to die to ourselves and to live for you and to live for your glory, to live for what matters, to live for eternity. And Father, I pray that in understanding your incredible love and affection for us. Father, that we would be willing to trust our lives into your hands. That we wouldn't have a clothing battle with you. That we would not push back against the way that you call us to live. But that we would trust you and truly believe that even though it's counterintuitive and even though it's not the way of the world, that your way really is the best way to live. And Father, I pray that you'd give us the, the faith that we might be able to trust you in this way. And that we would be able to clothe our lives with meekness. That we would not seek to advance our own agenda, but we would seek to advance the agenda of your kingdom. And Father, I pray that in doing that, you would empower us to live boldly and confidently in the power of your spirit for your glory and for your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.